I'm Nicholas Bornovs of Capital Inc. and I'm delighted and honored to welcome you at the keynote session of our forum. We have with us Mr. Andreas Soman Pau, the chairman of the BW Group, and uh, Mr. Michael Parker, the chairman of Global Shipping Logistics and Offshore of City. And this will be a one on one discussion. The title of this session is very fitting. It is Leaders of Change leading the maritime sector into the future. Both Andreas and Michael need no further introduction and clearly both of them play a key role in that process. So thank you to both for being with us and I'm turning the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, and good morning, Andreas. And it's good to see you Hi. virtually. It was very good to see you in person in October at the uh, Global Maritime Forum Summit. And a lot has of course happened since and we couldn't really kick off this conversation without talking about the consequences of the Russia-Ukraine situation and, of course, its wider impact on global trends. I suppose the fairly obvious question is, from a shipping perspective, do you see the situation as giving sort of the broader fossil fuel business an additional 10-year lifeline, particularly in the shipping context, or do you think it will act as a spur to the acceleration of many of the decarbonization initiatives around fuels and technologies, or both? Well, I like it that at the end you, you added this question or both, because that's, that's my belief. Um, I think we uh, spend a lot of time nowadays thinking in binary terms, um, either or, you know, the false dilemma or false dichotomy, uh, where we say either we have energy security um, or we have climate change mitigation, it's impossible to have both. Um, either we use traditional uh, fuels um, or, or we can't uh, you know, progress as, as, as humankind. And I think what the Ukraine war has shown us is that um, energy security is something that we have to have and it's difficult, in fact, to tackle climate change if you don't have energy security, because lack of energy security means social instability. And social instability means that you can't do what you need to do on climate change. Um, I do think that this will give a boost to renewables. There's no question that uh, we're going to try to find all possible answers. Um, so I think in terms of and uh, or both, as, as you were saying. Just one, one final thought on this. Actually, this is how we define ourselves as an organization, which is we say that we want to deliver energy for the world today and find solutions for tomorrow. Uh, so we want to be able to walk and chew gum. Well, I can certainly see from your background that, that, that you, the picture behind you is consistent with, with what you just said. Just before we move on to some of the uh, the, the, the the what around that future, J just for the perspective of people sitting in either Europe or the United States. H how is this Russia-Ukraine thing seen in Singapore? Is it seen as something very far away or does the, does the ramifications of it really hit home in somewhere like Singapore? So it's definitely front page news. And uh, I think uh, in, in Asia, like Europe, it's, it's something uh, that's seen of tremendous consequence. Singapore took the rather rare step of imposing sanctions on Russia early on before the UN uh, took any action. Uh, and it did so, um, in my view, because the idea of being able to um, invade or take over other states is something that is uh, sort of beyond the pale um, in, uh, for Singapore and, and most nations. Um, so it's very much, very much front of mind. Uh, I think we need to be careful with uh, how we respond and calibrate accordingly, because I think as individuals, we have the right to feel as um, indignant um, as we want to, and I'm you know, shocked by what I'm seeing in Ukraine, and I, I think it's very disturbing. Um, I think states, states and politicians have the right to make laws because they have access to good information and consequences. Corporates are in a very uh, tricky situation in the middle 
we can't act purely on emotions because we represent a small community. Um, and we also don't have the right or the information to make laws. And so if we all decide to make our own laws in defiance of international laws, that leads to chaos. And that's where corporates have a, have a tricky role right now to calibrate an appropriate response. Yeah, no, I understand that. And certainly uh, for, for many years uh, as a banker, you know, we've understood the complexities for companies, but also obviously for banks uh, having to manage the sanction, the impact of sanctions to stay on the right side of the law. But clearly, as you say, this is uh, the impacts on global trade affect an industry like shipping very particularly and, and knowing what you can and can't do is clearly very important. Let's move back to um, the topic that really was sort of uppermost everyone's mind before before the political events changed that. You, you're one of the leaders of change, as Nicola said, that, that the title of this is Leaders of Change, and, and you and Soren Sku, obviously, in Copenhagen for Maersk is, is another one. And the family behind Maersk has set up its Center for Decarbonization. But you're chair of the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization in Singapore. And you've been up and running for about nine months and formed various partnerships. Um, what, what focus has produced any unexpected lines of research or development? Because I think these centers really do represent a, an ability to be agnostic in a way that is sort of separate from individual companies' own focus and enable there to be re real intellectual uh, efforts to define that future. Well, what sort of lines of research have you seen being developed that were maybe mm. less obvious than the ones we've all originally talked about? Mm. Well, I think it's an important point you're making that these centers are collaborative efforts um, bringing together multiple stakeholders. And so they're not representing a singular point of view but actually trying to get um, as close as possible to you know, the, the truth, the best version of the truth. And I think the starting point is to um, be evidence-based, to be um, fact and science-based. And, and actually the team for GCMD, as we call it, Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, is, is, is built that way um, with engineers and scientists and, and uh, sort of deep thinkers on, on this topic. Um, you, you asked about research and lines of research. Actually, that's a really important component for the centers. But one of the um, aspects of the center um, that we have in Singapore is to really focus on doing as opposed to only researching. Uh, because I think it's very easy to get stuck at the level of theory. And it's really important then to, um, to, be, to be taking concrete action. Some of the lines of work right now, focal points, for instance, um, uh, ammonia, where there's been a lot of talk, a lot of study on ammonia, but the, the gap that was identified by GCMD is who's working on actual safe handling um, of ammonia, the operational aspects, and who's trialing it, and who's going to put in place the infrastructure to actually make it happen. And so uh, after a, a big mapping of the entire future fuels landscape, the ammonia landscape, we decided that this is an area that we want to be contributing to because there's a gap. Uh, some of the others just briefly, for instance, carbon capture um, on board um, or verification work, which is being do done by a number of parties, but to make sure that, you know, uh, what, what the, the, a, a green molecule, for instance, that it's really a green molecule, um, and a host of other, dozens of other projects that we're currently looking at, but all with this idea of uh, tangible action. Yeah. One of the things after, after uh, we met at the summit, obviously, was COP26, and a lot of the efforts that you were involved in with others was leading up to what impact we, the shipping industry, could have on COP26, and I think one of the most important announcements was the Clyde Bank Declaration talking about green green corridors. Uh, to me, the, 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 the significant thing was the five-year time frame those governments that signed it put on something happening. Everything is everything has been pushed out to dates that we see far away, but this was something with a real time frame of sort of five years from, from now. Um, do you see the center as becoming a sort of partner in the practical implementation of, of a policy like the Green Corridors, especially given the role Singapore plays um, in, 
in certain Asia trade routes? Do you see the center being an active participant in helping construct the framework for such a corridor? So I think it can, um, you know, potentially play play a good role in that. But again, the 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 sort of frame of reference for the center is where can we be contributing um, where others aren't already doing a great job and uh, you know where, where can we fill these gaps and so the assessment is really now how is the industry how are governments approaching uh, this particular topic and where can we plug in and, and help with that um and that that will really be the frame of reference so it's a bit difficult to be specific on how and where and what but i think it's a, a, an excellent initiative and the, the center will be looking to see if there's a way that we can be helpful the singapore government has been very supportive of, of the broader initiatives and, and and recognizes the important its physical location but also the 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 the, the, the the role that Singapore has sort of played in the industry. Are you, are you confident that other governments will live up to the same standards in terms of implementation, particularly in Asia, where you, you can see it more closely? Do you think that Singapore will, will be partnered properly by other governments in the region to make these things happen? So I think there is very strong political will. Um, it obviously varies country by country, and it's difficult to paint a broad brush across Asia and Southeast Asia, because there are many different governments with, with differing priorities. But generally, I think the, the will is, is strong. It, the will is there. Um, to state the obvious, governing is, is difficult in this day and age, because first, you have to have the space to sort of set the vision. Um, and I think a lot of governments are doing a good job of that when it comes to energy transition. They're sort of thinking big and, and trying to give a push. But then there's a lot of execution that has to follow, which I think is what you're, you're pointing at. And uh, execution is, is complicated at the best of times. But right now we have built systems where, you know, we've given... Uh, well, the democratic system in the past was that you chose your government and you trusted them for the next four years to um, make good decisions and take on board all the information and try to make good decisions. And now we've handed out millions of megaphones for everybody to shout about every uh, action, every decision, every policy, and it gets very noisy. And uh, this is more like uh, governing with... Uh, uh, well, I was going to say mob rule, but that's a bit unkind, but it's a sort of messy form of governing. It is what we have, so I'm not proposing solutions, but I think it gets in the way sometimes of executing long-term plans, because invariably there are people who, you know, have to um, make some sacrifices in order to, to move things forward. So maybe that's a little bit philosophical, but I think the will is there. The execution might take a little bit longer than uh, we would all hope for. The, the very visible elephant in the room, of course, is China. And uh, statistically, I think Asian ship owning overtook European ship owning in the last couple of months in terms of deadweight tonnage. And, and obviously, one could always play with statistics. But clearly, within that uh, trend, which I think we could see a few years ago, but clearly, China's role is, 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 is very much part of that. I'm often asked around the Poseidon principles of when will the Chinese sign up or will they ever sign up? And I, I uh, being in a shipping banker, I'm an optimist. And so the answer is always eventually, but it may take a few physical visits to persuade them. But do you see China, which is an active member of the IMO, do you see them joining in these broader initiatives and having their institutions participate in the, these collective policy initiatives? Mm. So I, I hope so. As you said, you know, sometimes these things take time. Um, there are some impediments. Uh, one of them is physical. You mentioned physical and travel and so on. And of course, because of circumstances, it's hard to create the connections in a, in a physical way. Uh, another one, you know, possible impediment, I would say, is just superpower dynamics. Um, are sometimes um, hesitant to sign up to 
institutions, uh, multilateral institutions, which they're not leading because it restricts their freedom of maneuver. And so I think they, they have a different calibration just sort of signing up, you know, for, uh, for all the global initiatives because they, they have to think about that element. And then, you know, another aspect is, is what I would call pragmatism uh, because, you know, the, the, the Chinese government, like any government, wants to um, balance this long-term vision for decarbonization. And by the way, I think China is very focused on this topic and doing a lot of things, uh, you know, in terms of renewable build-out. Um, but they want to maintain a degree, again, freedom of maneuver or pragmatism. If gas prices quadruple, they want to be able to move and, for instance, switch in the short term back to coal um, because, you know, it, it can have an impact on whether people freeze or whether people can, can afford food and so on. And, you know, to put this in context, even a country like Germany has to grapple with these difficult questions of pragmatism versus idealism. And Germany's GDP is $50,000 per capita GDP, and China is $10,000 per capita GDP. And so every country also is currently facing, it's back to your first question about energy security versus uh, climate change. You, you know, there's this balancing act that has to happen. So anyway, to cut a long story short, I think, um, you know, China, we have to allow for some time and some space. Um, and it's encouraging, at least, that they're, they're trying to push on whatever fronts they can. Yeah, no, good. I, I, I hope you're right. And I think we have to be uh, optimistic that they will, uh, they will join in all these efforts because they are such an important player in not just the industry, but clearly in global trade. I'd like to move the conversation a little bit closer to home to the BW Group. We've often talked about consolidation in the different sectors of shipping. Historically, we've seen a lot, obviously, on the container side. And you've been a leading player in consolidating a number of sectors under the umbrella of the BW Group. Do you see that process as having sort of paused for now, or do you see that strategy as being deployable in the opportunities in new technologies and energy storage and some of the things, the new things you're doing alongside some of the uh, traditional businesses under your umbrella? Mm. So we are, um, as you're saying, quite active in both spaces. So, you know, shipping and tr traditional energy, but also doing a lot now um, in solar, uh, in wind, in uh, batteries, in biofuels. So in total, we have 19 platforms across the group, uh, ranging from LNG and LPG and crude and products to, to these ones that I just mentioned. Um, and in terms of consolidation for the newer spaces, I think there are, there are benefits in consolidation, but it doesn't fit every circumstance. I don't think one can just sort of say consolidation is good uh, and therefore one should pursue it in all, in all cases. With these newer areas, uh, including renewables, um, there are... Uh, there are great opportunities for it because the landscape is shifting so much. And so I think we are seeing and will continue to see new constellations of, of companies coming together, working together. It also, in some ways, makes it a little bit harder because the speed of growth, the velocity is such that things are constantly in motion and changing. And so it becomes a little bit difficult to find a window where things are settled enough to sort of uh, agree on, on terms and how, how things should work. There's always the social dimension. So it's complex, but I do think it will continue. Do you see the capital demands in some of those businesses sort of accelerating or increasing very rapidly at some point when some of these alternatives, you know, become central to government policies or to commercial realities, if you like? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a really interesting question about capital availability, because, you know, um, and, uh, one way I would paint the picture is there are so many sources of capital um, and there are so many uses. And 
what we need to do a better job of is meshing and matching the two. I mean, if you think of sources of capital, you have government grants, you have loan guarantees, you have venture capital, family offices, mezzanine financing, senior debt, equity capital. I mean, just a long list of sources of capital which would like to go towards ESG. And then you have all these projects, and we talked about a few earlier, um, but different types of projects uh, and companies need different types of capital. Um, that's why I think that you know banks have such an important role in this, matching sources and uses. Um, and uh, if we can do a good job of it, I think we will really accelerate the transition. Yes, now one of the things I'm very conscious of is um, just le again leading up to COP, the announcement or the creation of the launch of Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, putting this so-called $130 trillion together has changed things because, and we've since also launched the Poseidon Principles for Insurance, again, under the auspices of the GMF. But actually this, the commitments financial institutions, asset managers and insurers are making under these uh, agreements is, is really around uh, committing to net zero by 2050, but also committing to forecast in their portfolios by 20, for 2030 and thereafter. So it, it, it's no longer sort of long-term ambition. It becomes very hard and fast, of course, as to what you're doing in in using your capital to create that that greener environment. So it sort of yeah. forces the reality on on where the money goes. But a key aspect of that, of course, is what is it you're measuring, and are you measuring progress? And so I think for shipping, transition is a very key part of that, clearly, because we can measure emissions. And one of the advantages through the IMO and the reg existing regulations is that ability to measure emissions. Maybe let's. Uh, move to uh, sort of uh, taking, uh, asking you to take a five year view on, on where shipping will be uh, in about five years in terms of being engaged in these changes that reflect its role in the global economy. Because I think that's one of the positive changes for shipping coming from COVID and other, and other things that it isn't just the physical trade that shipping physically moves, but it's also the role the industry plays for all the other companies whose cargoes shipping moves. Just give us a give us your vision of five years time and 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 uh, our ship owners positively perceived by society, or at least more better perceived than bankers, maybe. So I think shipping. Um, you know, some people say that it is difficult for um, shipping to punch too much above its weight. It's not a belief I have, by the way, and I'll explain why in a moment. But the, the thesis or, or the premise for that argument is that, you know, we can't actually change the um, emissions profile of what happens upstream of shipping. You know, if we're not producers and we're not responsible for what happens with flaring or with production and so on, even with the production of clean future fuels, there's only so much we can do then it's quite difficult for us to influence upstream. And similarly downstream, whether a refinery is clean or not, whether consumers switch to electric cars or, or, or not, or what, how much consumers consume is difficult for shipping upstream and downstream to have a big influence. The reason why I'm a bit more optimistic than that is because um, first of all, in mapping, in charting our future fuels for shipping, we can help to shape and inform um, what happens in other industries. So, you know, some of the um, aspects of future fuels, how you move them, how you consume them has applicability for other industries. And also I think we can punch above our weight because if you're going to move to a new system of moving these new fuels around, the ships need to carry it. Uh, some of it will move as electrons, but when you carry it as, as molecules, as clean molecules, then we need to be thinking about that from a shipping uh, perspective. So I think we have a big, big role to play. And I do think and hope that uh, people perceive that uh, we're, we're doing our part. I'm going to uh, just ask you a quick sort of few yes or no questions, which I haven't warned you about, so it will require you to react instantly. CCUS on ships. Well, 
you know, the, the simple answer is yes, but it's all about time scale. So I'm going to say yes and no, but I'm going to give myself a 30 year time scale uh, because if, if you ask me CCUS on board in the next five years, it's a no. So yes. Okay. When will scrubbers be banned? Uh, they will be phased over the next 10 years. Uh, they may never be banned as such. They will have ships with CCUS and scrubbers that will all look like car carriers or refineries or something. The, the, the picture of a ship yeah. will change with all the different technologies on board. Well, it'll phase, I, I think it'll phase out because the availability of these fuels because of carbon pricing or because of other factors, regulation will decline. And so, you know, it, it'll just decline, decline with it. Um, but I'm not sure that we need to ban the technology itself. Wind. Yes. Ships. Yes. And you'll see actually one of our sort of affiliates uh, behind me is, is Cadillac doing wind turbine installation vessels. And uh, we have another with floating wind, BW Ideal. And I'm a, a great believer in wind. Good. Um, sort of as we near the end of this conversation, just uh, not, not getting too personal, but we, we, we were able to have some very engaging conversations on Zoom during COVID as we were all stuck with lockdowns and putting aside all the sort of travel restrictions and what we've had to live with. Are you having more fun now as a ship owner than when you first took over from your father? It's always been fun, but uh, I am having a lot of fun uh, now. And, and yes, probably more, more fun than ever. Um, and part of it is just, you know, the, the, world is, um, the world is complex, which creates that sort of uh, challenge, intellectual challenge of trying to navigate the complexity. I think it's um, partly that we have some big uh, purposeful goals to address. Um, and so that is very motivating that we can try to solve these challenges. And thirdly, um, you know, I, I get a lot of energy from working with uh, great people. We have um, so many uh, smart people across our group, but also amongst our stakeholders and, and whether it's with customers or suppliers, certainly amongst the banks, of course. Um, but it is, uh, it's fun to work with so many good people uh, to tackle these challenges. So yes, having lots of fun. Good. Well, I, I'm going to ask a follow-up question, which is going to force you to answer the question in a different way, which is, you talk about complexity, and that we live in a more complex world, clearly, but you have such a big, successful enterprise under the umbrella. Is, the, is that speed and flexibility you have as a private company going to be challenged by the capital needs in future as this transition takes place? Uh, or, or do you think you're going to have to sort of look at your capital structure and some of that speed and flexibility as a private company will just have to be compromised to some extent by the need to just bring in vast amounts of external capital? It's a very thoughtful question because the world is getting bigger, companies are getting bigger, and capital needs are getting bigger. So, you know, you'll be aware of the statistics in the last uh, couple of decades, you know, the US GDP has doubled, Southeast Asia has gone up by six times. China has gone up by 10 times. The world is just a much bigger system. We have multiple trillion dollar companies now. And translating that into our own industry, I think there is a need to, to get bigger, which means external capital. I don't think that means giving up speed and agility. Uh, and it's maybe an echo of the and versus the or that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, because in an ideal world, one can find partners, whether it's capital markets or private equity or sovereign wealth funds, and this is what we try to do, find good partners, um, bring in um, external capital, sometimes it's industry peers, uh, but keep that dynamism, agility, speed of decision making, uh, so that we can have the best of both worlds. Yeah, no, I, I hope you're right, and I know that you will be a lot You'll be around for a long time and a lot longer than I will, but also that you will 
continue to be one of those leaders of change, but also, as you've always done, uh, not respond to short-termism and to bring a mature and long-term and pragmatic thinking, not just in what you say, but also in the business you do. So it's been a pleasure talking to you, Andreas, as always, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again in person soon. And with that, I'll hand back to Nicholas. Thank you. Well, I would like to say that a tremendous thanks to both of you. It has been, uh, as expected, a very insightful and dynamic discussion. And uh, thank you to both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.